Broadcasting from the Any Hour Services Podcast Studio, I'm your host, Mike Wilson, and you're listening to In the House. In the House is a podcast about the major systems in the house, electrical, plumbing, heating, air conditioning. Each week, I'm joined by a panel of experts. We pick a topic and we go deep. It's meant to be informative and hopefully bring you some value. This week, we're going to be talking about your electrical systems. We're going to kind of lay a foundation since this is our first electrical episode. We'll talk about how your electrical system works and how you're interacting with it. We've had some questions and things submitted uh, through social media. We'll talk about those. Uh, But today, I'm joined by three electricians. I've got Troy Miller, Shane Allred, and Brett Knapp. They've got 65 years of combined electrical experience, but they've been in the... uh, uh, construction and building industry for longer than that. So anyway, gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Happy thank to you. Be here. Glad to be here. All right. So we're, we're going to start out and we're going to talk about the basics of your electrical system. So, you know, Shane, tell me what actually makes up your, when we talk about the electrical system, what makes up the electrical system in your home? So in your home, you first have to start out outside your home. Okay. Um, you've got power generation plants. As you drive around, you'll see some of those put on a lot of steam. There's coal fired, so it's got to be produced somewhere. Those are usually transmitted on great big power lines, very high voltage power lines, which are then trans- trans- transformed down, so it's down to lower voltages. Okay. Once you get to your house, it's going to be 240 volts, 120 on each leg. So it's down quite, quite a bit. And some homes have over, overhead feed, so you're going to see a wire going across their yard or driveway. Uh, some have an underground feed. You'll have a pipe coming out of the ground, so all that power is underneath the ground there. Um, that usually goes into a main breaker box on the outside. You've got a switch outside that you're going to flip on and off. That usually turns off the power to your whole house. So the first part that mm-hmm. it, the first place it stops is usually the meter bulb, yep. right? So yep. that's where the, it's going to measure the amount of power that we're using beyond that point anywhere in the house. And so now some houses do have that box on the outside where it's got a main shut off, uh, but others don't, right? They've just That's got correct. the bulb that the wire yep. is. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's still some in my neighborhood. I drive around and it's, you've got the wire. It looks super sketch. <laughs> you know, the wire's <laughs> just kind of like, you know, going into the little bulb there. But um, so do you, do you guys know when about like roughly if your home is this old, um, it should have that box on the outside? What's been about the last probably 30 to 40 years, they've started requiring those main breakers on the outside. If you just have that bulb on the outside of your house, um, the power coming into your house is completely unprotected. So until it gets to that breaker box, there's no way to shut that off. So it's just like the power line inside your house. Now on a, on a home that doesn't have that uh, a, a, a meter on the outside, a meter box, and it's just going straight into the bulb and then straight into the house, would you say that most of those have a fuse panel rather than a breaker box or is it either or either or Yeah, it can be either way some do have fuses right the panel box some are breakers they're older style um, but it can be either or on that mm-hmm. okay. so, something to take into consideration is a lot of people will get meters and panels mixed up the yes. meter technically is the the bulb part that actually measures mm-hmm the power that the, when the city when the city uh measures their power and it gives you your power bill uh-huh. that's off the meter Got but it. the actual the can or the enclosure in which it's in those can be have nothing like we talked about where you just have the meter bulb and there's nothing else they can have a single breaker or there's some combinations that actually have all the pan, all the breakers there and so when we say meters and panels there, there's quite a bit of a difference there because the only thing that is actually the city's is the bulb that yes. measures it. The That's rest right. of it is actually of the homeowner's, gotcha. the homeowner's responsibility. There's always got to be one in every group. And I've decided that Brett is the one. That was Brett that was just talking that has that super, like, talking to Brett. Like, what did I, what did I do? Uh, why, I don't know why. I think, it's, uh, I think it's the guys producing the show that just want to make me sound as bad as possible. They invite guests in. Your voice sounds amazing. What? I'm like over here. I'm like something that I sound stupid. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, Brad, sounds, you sound good. Sounds Keep great. it up. We'll give yeah. the whole 45 minutes. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> good. I'm good. No. Okay. So, so we talk. Okay. So the power is generated wherever, and then it comes in. But as far as your electrical system is concerned, on your home, it begins there at the yeah, meter exactly. that's on, on the, the outside, outside of the home. That okay. Is correct. Then where does it go? So, from, go ahead, Troy. From there, there's an overcurrent device, right? A breaker that protects that. SER 
that goes into the home to the panel typically, right? Yep, and the SER, and you guys talk as technical as you want. I just wanna like translate sometimes when, when we're speaking electrical jargon that people understand. And the SER is that the big trunk line, the wires that go from that meter uh, to the panel inside the house. It's that what's carrying the bulk of the, the power that you're gonna be using. Yeah, it's gonna be the largest, you know, Conductor. Barring some other things maybe installed, it's going to be the largest wire in your house hold, holding the most amount of amperage or capacity, capacity going into, yep. the, into yep. the home. Because your whole house basically is going to feed off that one main wire coming in. Gotcha. Typically yes. aluminum, right? Yes, Typically. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. In okay. a home. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so meter, got that trunk line, the SER goes to the panel. Keep going. So one thing, again, we forgot to uh, discuss about the meter is the grounding system. Okay. Out by the meter, right? That's another component. Don't bang on the table, bro. To the electrical system. <laughs> <laughs> um, it needs to be grounded properly, right? Okay. Um, so just wanted to bring that up. So uh, the SAR goes into the home, and then we have the panel. Actually, let me, let me just let me back up there because the uh, the grounding is a very important very part important. of the home's electrical system, and a lot of people might think that the grounding is, uh, you know, since you bring the power in to the home, that the ground is also brought into the home, but that's not the case. It's you create the, the ground mm -hmm. right there at the meter by yep. driving ground rods yep. into the ground uh, and any excess current. That's where all of that goes. Yep. Or a U for ground, which is tied right into the rebar that goes into the uh, foundation of the home. Don't you have to have both, like, uh, or multiple? So, so currently, the current code now is to have the U for ground. So all new homes being constructed and built right now, you ha it's required to have a U for ground. Gotcha. So the older homes, right, they didn't have that U for ground. So therefore, we did two ground rods six feet apart to create that grounding system at the meter. Yeah, and some gotcha. of even the older ones, they, they'll use the cold water ground, yep. which now as, you know, you can probably hear on our plumbing shows, as you start to replace main water lines with a uh, poly or a non-metallic water line, you can obviously see uh, obviously see the issues with that as you start to pull that metal out. There's really no grounding system there anymore, which is why those two ground rods is a much better grounding system. That's okay. correct. All right, sorry. So we got the grounding system is created outside, and then that's where it's created there at that meter, and then it's carried, the ground is carried in through over that SER. That is correct, to okay. the panel. Okay, keep going. Yep. So then you got the, the, you got the panel, which is typically inside of the house. Again, Brett said earlier that you could have a combination on the outside of the house with the meter, but you got your panel. Inside of that panel, um, you've got your neutrals, you've got your ground, and you've got your two hot wires, two phase, um, or sorry, single phase two wire, which produces the 240 volts inside of a home. Uh, then from there, you've got individual breakers that carries the power um, to specific places inside of the home. You've got devices, you've got lights, um, whatever power is required inside of that home. Gotcha, and each breaker is usually, uh, we call it a, a branch circuit or a circuit that that's controlling. That is correct. And that usually will have multiple devices, so you'll have um, several outlets on the same circuit. Um, sometimes you'll have lights on the same circuit as, as some outlets, um, but okay, so you've got the individual breakers going off. What are some other, we talked about outlets, you know, what are some other components that make up your electrical system? So basically for, from the panel, the panel's kind of the heart of the system from yep. there, everything branches out. Now you're gonna go into, you have appliance circuits, which are gonna be like for small appliances on a kitchen. The kitchen you're gonna something. have dryers, which are gonna be your, he you know, your larger appliances. So dryers, ovens, air conditioners, welders, those are usually your 220, take up two breaker spots. And then from there, you're gonna get into just more like bedrooms, random lighting, so you're gonna have lights, outlets, light, lighting fixtures, things of that nature throughout the house. Okay, so um, in so that's kind of the basics of your electrical system. I had a lot of people on social, uh, one of the questions that they asked is, how long does your electrical system last? And uh, you know, it's, it's not quite like a water heater or a furnace, uh, so give me y'all's opinions on like how long your electrical system lasts. So the big question, how long should it last or how long do they last? That's, that's a very good point. Let's talk about both. How long should they last and how long do they last? So they should last a really long time because when you think of when you get into uh, plumbing, you have a lot of moving water, you know, things that, you know, erosion that happens, corrosion, those types of things. You get into HVAC, you got a lot of moving parts in electrical other than the plugging in and in and out of the, the device. devices, even breakers. If, <clears throat> if everything's working properly and installed mm -hmm. properly and being operated properly, breakers shouldn't even turn off. So there's really no moving pieces to a 
do an electrical system, which I mean, you're la- you're talking decades. It, it should last. Now, when you start to have breakdowns where maybe it wasn't installed correctly, there was a connection that wasn't tightened, or those connections weren't on some of the more major ones inside the panel or things of that nature, if they weren't gone back and maintained and you know tightened along the way, then each one of those starts to create a failure point, which depending on you know, again, how it was installed and how, you know, how it's been maintained. They get, I mean, I've seen, I was in a house that was three months old and was already having an issue with, with one of the circuits. Whereas one that would have been properly installed, never would have had that issue. I mean, you, I've been to houses, you guys have been to houses 50 years old, no yeah. issues whatsoever. Yep, everything's good. So it really all goes down to the installation as well as going back through and making sure you know, on the maintenance that things are actually staying as tight as they're supposed to be. Yeah, connections um, can be a big issue when you're talking about the electrical system inside of a home, um, vibrations can cause connection issues, stuff like that. So the maintenance on those are very important. And if done properly, right, um, they should last a long time. Um, Also, when you're talking about an electrical system, code has changed quite often, right? Every three years it's updated. And so if you go back far enough, back in the 70s, 60s, right, you had aluminum wire. You had panels that maybe didn't function the way they were supposed to function, right? So those branch circuits that we talked about earlier, when you're putting a load on them, if you're overloading that circuit, that breaker is designed to trip, okay? That's to protect the wire, device, everything downline. Um, If it's not protecting that properly, then is what happens is you create heat, expansion, contraction, that kind of stuff happens, right? And you start having connection issues with that. So it starts at the panel, right? Because that's the heart and soul of the system. And then again, it gets into wiring, whether it's aluminum or copper. Um, what have you got in the home? And that really determines um, how long it should last and it, it's going to last. Copper is a lot better metal, right? Than aluminum is. Um, some of the older panels didn't function and trip breakers when they should, like the newer ones do now. And so that's it's pretty can be a pretty loaded question when you ask how long should a system last there's a lot of components to it that will determine that gotcha so if it's installed properly um should last a really long time um and as we go on with the with this series with this show and talking about electrical we'll we'll dive in super deep we will have an episode just on breakers and just on outlets and and different things like that so um uh, Shane, did you want to weigh in on how long your electrical system should last? Yeah, if you go online and stuff, you can see a lot of places it will say 30, 35 years is how long it should last. But like like Troy and Brett said, I don't think there's a real solid number on that. You've also got a lot of stuff in, uh, in homes. You've got humidity in homes sometimes. You've got, uh, I mean, you start getting outside of the meter. I mean, what side of the house is it on? Is this where the sun shines all the time? Does it get hot? Does it get water inside of it? So we go into homes like Brett said that it, that it can be three months old and they've had a, a plumbing leak and somehow it's dripped inside the panel and it's completely rusted. So it just all depends. So cool. So the answer is there's no telling. Uh, <laughs> but no. Get know, an electrician out there to look at it. Right. That's actually where I'm going. We had a lot of questions that people were saying, what, what is some maintenance that I can do? Uh, what should I be doing to my electrical system as far as maintenance? And as far as some of the other systems, as far as the water heaters and furnace and things like that, you know, I try and break the maintenance to, to bring as much value to the audience as possible. I try and break the maintenance into, um, here's the stuff that you can do yourself. And here's the stuff that you should probably have a professional, uh, take a look at. So talk to me, let's, let's cover first. Are there some things that a homeowner can do themselves that is maintenance to your electrical system? I don't know that I would consider maintenance that they would do themselves, but the biggest thing is being aware of the electrical mm-hmm. system. Like one of them is you've ever had where you plug in an outlet and it falls out, okay. right? Exactly. That's nothing more than a loose connection that it's not staying tight. And so you start to create arcing and there, there's a lot of issues that can happen with that. You know, people tripping on the cord, you know, they're, they're, like I said, there's a lot of issues that can happen with that. So being aware of those types of things, smoke detectors, a lot of people don't know actually have an expiration date that they stopped sensing you know, after a certain time. And so making sure that those, now these may, you know, may not be things that people can do themselves, but by, by having those things done regularly, they, they're gonna lengthen the life of their electrical system. Cause as we, as, and I know it sounds like it's unrelated, but as you start to change a smoke detector, you can start to see, 
okay, hey, what's the kind of work? Like how good are the connections behind there? And yes. if the connections behind a smoke detector that's up in the up in the ceiling that nobody's touching are looking kind of loose or not in great condition, what's the connections going to look like behind an outlet that people are plugging in all the time? And that's what, as an electrician, when I go and change a smoke detector and I see those connections, I'm like, oh, well, maybe we should check some outlets to see what the rest Absolutely. of the connections in the house look like. Yep. So again, it's doing the things changing, you know, having your smoke detectors changed uh, the right time, you know, outlets that maybe are loose and, you know, are basically are getting worn out. I think those change. Can I piggyback yeah, on that outlets. really quick? So outlets that are loose, right? When you're plugging something into that device, and if that file falls out, like Brett said earlier, um, be aware of that. Don't keep plugging things into that device because guess what happens? Arcing starts, right? Because of the loose connection, and and that can create a big problem, right? And so that you need to be aware of that. Um, all, they, all they have to do is just bend the problems out. I was just out, thinking right? that yeah. you just squeeze them together, or bend them out. <laughs> that's that's the fix. Yeah, no, uh, that's not a fix. No, I know. <laughs> another thing to look for too, or, or to fill, is, is use your hands and as you're as you're plugging stuff in or touching switches. If you're ever feeling heat, yes. if it's getting warmer than anything else. Whenever you have a bad connection, it creates resistance and that creates heat. So a lot of times just by touching something and feeling heat, you can, you can feel that something's going on. I, I posted a video on uh, TikTok over the weekend and people lost their minds. It was it's the first video that I ever posted that like really just kind of blew up. I think it's over 300,000 views right now. And what it was, it was simply, I took one of the outlets that we, pulled out of a house where the back of it was mm -hmm. melted I saw that. and I, I held it up. I was like, Hey, look, this outlet looks normal. So anything, something a homeowner can do, go around and feel, feel. the outlets, mm -hmm. feel the switches and see if anything feels warm because that particular outlet that I was holding when it has a faceplate on it on the surface, just looking at it looks totally normal, but I turn it around and the back of it is melted off on one of the uh, on one of the terminals. And I have found that so many times. Just mm -hmm. going to people's yeah. houses, my oh, that's not working. Well, it looks fine. Let's pull it open. Pull that, as soon as you pull it, it open, you just see the black inside the box, yeah. the black on the wire. Like story after story of people like my house burned down from this. Yeah. Like I'm so glad that you're getting this information out. And then some of the funnier ones are like. Uh, I'm now walking around the house filling all of my outlets. <laughs> no, and that, that's a good thing homeowners can do, yeah. right? I mean, that heat is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Realize, though, if you're dealing with a dimmer, that creates heat. Mm -hmm. So a dimmer is something different. Yeah, yeah. we talked about that. What I, what I actually told him is I said a dimmer is going to be warm, mm -hmm. but it should not be so hot that you can't that's touch correct. it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's correct. really the only uh, you know, comment and, or the only stipulation there as far as like things being warm. A lot, a, of these, a lot of these outlets too, um, you don't have to have anything plugged into them. Correct. The way wiring works in homes is you go from one outlet to another outlet to another outlet. So you might be plugging something in clear on the other side of the room and this outlet over here is getting hot because there's connection points on everyone feeding that power through. Yep. Some, some dude tried to like chime in. I had to shut him down. He's like, he's like, it's only if you have something plugged in. I was like, mm, no, 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 bro. that electricity is always <laughs> flowing. Exactly. Yep. So, um, okay. So we, okay. So we start out talking about maintenance. Okay. So, so some things that people can do here's, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Here's a list that I will usually give people of basic things that you, that they can do. Um, I think that uh, changing the batteries in your smoke detector is uh, something that needs to be done maintenance wise every year. And that leads you into the conversation that the, that the smoke detector goes bad, but uh, replacing the smoke detectors, we'll talk about being aware of like different things later, but changing the smoke detectors. Um, I actually think that you should be going around and testing the GFI outlets. Um, so you're not really maintaining it, but you are testing that mechanism because a GFI outlet and we'll have a whole show on that, but you know, all you got to do is push the test button and then push the reset button. Reset if button. it resets mm -hmm. and it comes back on, that's all you have to do to like Just check sure that thing. Clicks. Right. Um, and then another thing that I don't hear a whole lot of people talk about, but that <laughs> I've noticed over the years, one owning a home and going into other people's homes, um, dirt and dust really can kill a lot of things in your home. So when you're trying to maintain things, just keeping things clean. And, a, and a, one of the things is um, with your smoke detectors, if you ever notice like dust or spider webs or things building up around there, like just take something and dust them or take your vacuum and vacuum those things off. Another one is actually uh, bathroom exhaust, exhaust fans. fans. Yep. Mm -hmm. exactly. uh, those things. Yep. All of the dust that's in that yep. bathroom, and it usually has humidity in the air as well, so it kind of clumps up and creates this layer of 
you know, fuzz on it and it makes the fan work less efficient effectively and that stuff gets sucked up in there. And when you get all of that stuff on the motor and the windings and things like that, it's more of a load on that motor has to work harder. Correct. So, you know, take, take some compressed air, excuse me, and and blow those things off and just kind of keep those components clean. Yeah. They're typically pretty easy to, to remove a fan cover, right? It's just spring loaded. So you can pull those down, Mm -hmm. put them in your tub, spray them off real quick. Wipe the inside of the housing off to get rid of all that dirt and dust, yep. but that's a really good idea. Yep, absolutely. Mike, I, real quick, I think we should also talk about what we're talking about, GFIs and smoke detectors. Where, the, where is the homeowner going to find these things in their house, or where should they be? Okay, um, so you guys tell me where where are those things, and, and keep in mind, like we'll we'll have episodes where we dive like mm-hmm. super deep on those things, but let's let's talk basics since we're talking yeah. about the basics of the system. Let's talk about a GFI first. It stands for ground fault circuit interrupter. So, where are those things installed? Where would they find them? So bathrooms, okay. Kitchens, yep. Garages, yep. Outside outlets, yep. Unfinished basements, yep. Those are your major five. Now the the purpose of a, a GFI is to protect you from electrical shock and all of those locations that Brett mentioned in the code book, they call them wet locations, right? Mm -hmm. So anywhere where there's the potential of water and electricity and you being wet and operating and and messing with the electricity. And so it's just an extra, it's not like a breaker. There's a, it shuts the power off so fast that it doesn't have time to shock you. It senses yeah. that there's that there's a break in the current and that it assumes it's going through you and it trips the it cuts the power off so that it's a safety device. And those didn't always exist, you know. We oh. talk about codes um, all the time and codes are there. Um, a lot of people when they hear code, they're like, oh, that's the government trying to get me to spend more money or or big electrical trying to make my house cost more. But take a second and talk about what electrical codes are codes are there to protect us i mean you talk about the gfi right that's there to protect us from getting harmed right um codes are depends on how you want to look at code but code is minimum performance standards right that's Mm -hmm. the minimum at least do this um and so that's kind of where the whole the whole code stuff starts is right there. Well, they're minimum safety standards, right? Yeah. What did I say? Performance, performance standards. Sorry. Yeah. You're thinking about managing standards. the technicians. Yeah. <laughs> safety standards. Thanks, Mike, for for catching that. But yeah, um, safety standards. And again, it's it's there to protect you. Over time, we find it's just like anything: automobiles, seat belts, right? We found that if you wear a seat belt, you're safer. If you get in an accident, right, um, it's going to help save your life or lessen mm-hmm. the damage that that accident does to you yep. same thing with electricity yeah right? so the go ahead Jeff. No, i was gonna say a lot of times especially when we start talking about the gfcis and things of that nature most people think that like their circuit breakers are there to protect them and maybe i'm gonna you know rep, rep uh, i have a radio commercial that goes exactly where <laughs> right? you're talking about it, like the gfcis those types of things are actually there to design design to you know to be safe for the person to protect the person whereas circuit breakers and things that we normally think of as protective things are there to protect the wiring to prevent fires and those that's things. correct yep. yep um so the nec the national electrical code um correct me if i'm wrong it it started out actually as something that the nfp uh, the Ni- National Fire Protection Agency or whatever, it was an addendum there because uh, they, as they were investigating fires and things, they were finding that electrical fires were contributing to mm-hmm. those fires and deaths and things like that. So the way that I will explain uh, codes in the home is that over time, as we learn how we're interacting with our electrical system, you take a look at the previous data of where did electrical shocks, injuries, and deaths come from, and fires, and how can we eliminate those Mm -hmm. moving forward by engineering a better product, safer installation, and safer interaction with our electrical system. Is that that accurate, would you say? Absolutely. It is. Um, So we talked about GFIs, so uh, ground fault circuit interrupters, they're there to protect us from electrical shock. They're in uh, wet locations. Uh, Shane, you mentioned smoke detectors. So let's talk about where smoke detectors are. So smoke detectors, uh, when Mike's talking about the NEC also, so the NEC actually changes every three years. They put out a new code book. So a home that's even 10 years old, you've got two or three changes in there. So you can have a home that's relatively new and still not meet today's safety code standards. 
So how's that? Uh, let me let me stop you right yep. there. And all that means when when Shane says the code changes, really it's just updated to be to yeah, make sure better. that our homes are yep. safer. Yeah. And so when you hear like, hey, this isn't up to code, all that really means is that this isn't as safe as it could be. There is a potential there to do you or your home harm. Harm. Yes. Sorry, keep going. No, so so back to smoke detectors. So uh, about 15, 20 years ago, it used to just be smoke detectors, but now it's smoke detection and carbon monoxide detection. Yep. So we've got smoke detectors. By code, we should have one in every bedroom. Um, bedrooms, I mean, if there's no window in a room, that's not really a bedroom, but any, any, any bedroom should have that. Outside of the bedroom in the hallway, and at least one on each floor should be a carbon monoxide smoke detector combo. And now uh, the neat thing about these new smoke detectors is they're all tied together. So any new home is gonna have a wire in the home that runs to every smoke detector in the house. So if you have a basement bedroom downstairs and something does happen, some fire does start, every, every detector in this whole house is gonna ring. So, you, I mean, the only reason for a smoke detector is to get you out of the house as quickly as possible. Right, it's there to, so, it's not there to put the fire out, no. it's there to warn you that there's a fire going on so that you've got an opportunity to get out. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, is May uh, fire protection fire month or is that sure electrical month safety it is. month? Cut that out, Austin, since I don't know what <laughs> I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> all right, so we talked about, uh, let's see, we talked about maintenance. Um, uh, we talked about how long the system should last. Oh, let's talk about, uh, we, we talked about the, the lifespan of your electrical system really depends on the installation and things. Let's talk about the things, uh, what homeowners can do proactively that maybe they would want a professional to come out and check. Like we. We hear electricians say, um, hey, you should have your electrical system inspected periodically. Let's talk about how often that should happen um, and why. Because I think that a lot of people, when they hear like, oh, this company, this service company is selling an electrical inspection. They must be looking for work to do. But let's talk about what an inspection is, how often they should do it, and why we think that they should. Troy. Well, first of all, <clears throat> an electrical inspection, it starts at the panel, right? The heart and soul of the system. We want to go in there. We want to look at the pa panel, the condition of the panel, right? See if there's any loose connections. That's the biggest thing we're looking for, right? Um, make sure everything's tight. Make sure everything's secure. Um, vibration will cause loose connections, and so you have to be aware of that, right? There's always vibration stuff going on. Um, so, yeah, checking for loose connections. Um, making sure breakers are functioning properly. And it's just, and, and homeowners can do this also. You can go down to your panel and you can just this turn. This is another maintenance thing. You can, can just do. turn breakers on and off, right? Just turn them off, turn them back on. Realize you're going to lose power, clocks, that kind of stuff. Um, but you can, don't obviously pull the panel cover off, leave sure. it on there, but turn those breakers off and on. And so that's one thing we want to check also and make sure that they are turning off and turning back on. And, and as we turn them off, we check and make sure the power is off and then turn it back on and make sure we're getting the correct, correct voltage. Um, voltage is a big thing also. Um, we want to check voltage coming out of those breakers to make sure the voltage coming into the panel and leaving those breakers are the same. There's no difference there. Uh, and then just make sure that uh, inside of the panel that you've got uh, your neutrals and your grounds isolated. Uh, that's a big thing also. And that's where it starts with an inspection. And it goes into a lot of other things. But and. and and yeah, your meter, we want to make sure that again, outside the meter out there, we have um, all the connections, the grounding, all that stuff taken care of also in an inspection. To, to, check add, all to add one more thing to that, and something that we, we do in our electrical inspection is doing a thermal test, like a, you know, taking a temperature mm -hmm. reading, because you look on breakers, there's two connection points. You have this part right here that actually connects into to the, the panel, busing. and that's actually back behind the plastic with the panel cover on and even the breaker on, you can't see that. For right. those that are for those that are just listening and not watching a video, uh, Brett's holding a breaker, and there are uh, connection points on the breaker where you take the the wire that is, or there's a connection point where it snaps into the panel, and that's where it gets the uh, the the voltage for that particular circuit. And then there is another connection uh, where you're about to explain where the, the wire for the circuit, that's what carries it out. And the breaker is sitting in the middle, but there are two connection points. Sorry, go yes. ahead. Keep talking. Sorry, my bad. No, you're good. And so when you think about it, if that connection is bad, a lot of times it's going to first manifest, manifest itself in heat because as that connection gets hotter and hotter and it starts to burn out, 
that's one of the things you, as you test is you use a thermal, you know, thermometer or a laser thermometer to test that. And you can yep. say, okay, Hey, if a breaker is operating 10, 20 degrees above normal, it's like, wow, maybe something's behind. And that's an indication for us to kind of pop back behind there to see if that's the problem. The other one is where the actual wire goes into the breaker as you point out where, and that's the ones that we actually go through and tighten down with the screwdriver because over time, as the copper expands and contracts with vibrations, it's going to loosen itself up and we can tighten those ones down. But the ones back behind the breaker, those ones, you can't tighten down. You can't fix like once it's burned itself out now you have to check the condition of the panel and be like okay hey is it just the breaker that needs to be replaced or has it done damage to the panel to where now we have to start considering needing to replace the entire panel yeah and a lot of people don't realize that a loose connection is is a lot it's like an arc weld right <laughs> That's great. and so you've got so much heat and and the material is burning up so if you've got a breaker on that bus bar in the panel and it has gotten to the point where it's starting to uh, arc and it's pitting in on that bus bar you can't you could replace the breaker but that's not always the best thing because mm -hmm. any gap that you've got between the the conductive material there's a potential there for arcing and More it's going to, to yeah. it's going to continue to happen Absolutely. and this time what if you don't what if you don't have an electrician out there doing a thermal test and it happens faster than you expected the last time cuz electricity you know the reason there's so many safety codes and things is because sometimes it's unpredictable yep. you know you've got the laws of physics and the way that electricity works but man it is dangerous when it is not performing when you're not aware of the way that electricity operates and i'll give you just a, a short story of i went to a video game um uh, arcade at, at the mall over there in provo and we showed up and i was doing my my test because we were doing it was a normal diagnosis and i pulled out my laser thermometer and on the main lugs and i didn't think you know uh, video game plays they're going to pull a lot of electricity this one was pulling a lot i put i uh tested the breakers i think it was like 80 something degrees where the room temperature i put the thermometer up or the laser thermometer up on the lugs that where the main power was coming in it was like 300 degrees wow and it was nothing more as soon as i tightened it down i could i was able to get a full turn on that on that uh lug and once i was able to get it uh, tightened down came down to 200 down to 150 and it's amazing just that one loose connection because there was arcing happening behind it you don't see it but you it just that heat was created. I mean, you're talking 300 degrees on this metal, you know, is what was happening just by the, the connection not being tight. Mm -hmm. And something that I've seen quite a bit actually going out there when you've got that kind of heat and you've got that extra current coming, uh, it doesn't always like because metal is going to not melt as fast as the insulation that is around that That's wire correct. and all of a sudden if you've got that heat and it starts to it's most noticeable on you know a neutral that's supposed to be white and you look at it and black. it's brown mm. and black and it's like going further up uh notice that a lot on actually those old uh, light fixtures that you know you put too hot too high a voltage bulb in them and all of a sudden they're pulling way more power than they're supposed to not enough to trip the the thing but that's why that wattage recommendation is on those light fixtures so that you don't burn the wires up it's not so that you have to strain your eyes <laughs> but uh okay cool so how did we get on that what were we talking about maintenance maintenance okay so oh no we were talking about the, the inspection. Electrical, yeah, electrical inspection okay so so mainly one of the big things that we're looking for are loose connections because loose connections are the biggest killer of your electrical system it's going to cause it to degrade and wear out faster than it necessarily should yep. so we're looking for loose connections um heat uh what are some other things that that you look for with uh in the electrical inspection so we're also looking at like i talked about smoke detectors uh -huh. we want to make sure smoke detectors are in every room um there's something that every home really needs to have they also have a lifespan on them yep. um, if you look right on the back of them they say replace in 10 years so we want to make sure that those detectors are working properly and uh, that the people are safe inside. Um, okay. Like Troy said, we're talking, we're looking at GFIs like we talked about before too. We want you to be protected that way. But uh, a lot of these inspections, a lot of it's visual. Um, we don't open every plug in the house, but we are touching stuff, laser thermometers, laser stuff thermometers like that. Laser thermometers is a big one. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good um, point, like Brett said as well, is, you know, Sometimes all it takes is opening a couple of devices, mm -hmm. taking a cover plate off of one and seeing mm -hmm. the condition back there because usually all of those devices are installed by the same electrician same way. with the same level of workmanship, um, whether they are tightening things down 
all the way or not. And so that's, you don't have to go through necessarily and uncover every single thing and look, you're never going to look at every single connection point, but like you said, you're looking mm -hmm. for signs uh, that something could be going wrong there. Um, anything else obvious in the electrical inspection that you're, that you're checking? Uh, one thing we do a lot too is just ask the homeowner. The homeowner knows better than we do what's going on with their electrical. They might have switches. You'll turn a switch on and they can kind of hear a crackling sound a little bit. Those switches are being worn out. Uh, Tori said, like Tori said, they're, they're falling out of uh, outlets, stuff that you're plugging in. So does the homeowner really notices more than even what we do, what's going on with their electrical. Well, let's, let's stop there and talk for a second about, Brett, you mentioned earlier, awareness you know, just being aware of your electrical system. Let's talk about uh, the things that they need to be aware of. We mentioned, uh, you know, making sure you're not like, going around and feeling things, making sure you're not feeling heat. Uh, you mentioned noises, uh, Shane, popping and crackling mm -hmm. and sizzling when you're flipping a switch on and off. Uh, what are some other things that people can notice that could be a sign that there might be an issue going on with their electrical system? Dimming lights is a huge one, mm -hmm. right? If you see your lights dim, get brighter that kind of stuff um, be aware of that if that happens now, a lot of times um, you might notice that more in the summer when you have a big load come on mm -hmm. where the air conditioner kicks on and then all of a sudden the lights kind of dim down and then come back up um, I'm curious you guys opinions what um, what causes that and what's the fix so sometimes when you see your lights dimming when an air conditioner kicks on, it's going to be from the, the draw that it takes to get a motor spinning. So right when a motor starts spinning, you might also see it like on a vacuum cleaner. It takes a lot of power when, when that's starting out, and that'll actually drop your voltage just a little bit. And then as soon as that comes up to speed, it pops right back up. Um, but dimming lights, like Troy talked about, you can also have a, a bad neutral in a house. And if you get dimming lights like that, usually when something's dimming, a lot of times something's actually getting brighter. So you can actually burn up a lot of stuff. So anything that's dimming, another thing we, we don't talk a lot about is smell. Everybody knows what a, a nasty electrical smell smells like. If you're ever smelling Stink any smell. kind of an electrical smell like that, it's time to get somebody, a professional out there to, to figure out what's going on. Okay. Um, so let me ask you, because I think so many people, it is very common knowledge that like, oh yeah, every time the air conditioner kicks on, the lights dim. So like, what, what is the fix for something like that? Well, first of all, check your, getting a licensed electrician out there to check those connections, make sure the connections are, are good, right? <clears throat> There's some things, the devices you can put on the AC, right? To drop that load when that does kick on. Cause anytime a motor does kick on, like Shane said, um, it draws more amperage, right? And so there's devices, there's things that we can put on the AC to help with that, right? Gotcha. But first of all, make sure the connections, cause again, dimming lights, if you got loose connections, it's gonna manifest itself, right? By putting a load on that circuit. It's, it's, it's resisting, it's stopping that current, that flow of current. Gotcha. All right, so even though you are experiencing it all the time and it's happened in every house that you've ever lived in, just because it's normal does not mean that it's supposed to be happening. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it doesn't happen in my house. Like every time the air conditioner on, it, the, yeah. the lights don't. Uh, and the, the greater the integrity of the system, meaning mm -hmm. the size of the wire coming the, in, uh, the condition of the connections, the, the devices on the air conditioner to reduce the load, but also the greater the integrity of the system, the less... Uh, dimming you'll have is so this, go ahead one thing you have to realize too if you've got a hundred amp panel coming into the house and that service wire that feeds that panel is only can only handle 100 amps on it right i've seen a acs kick on and they're pulling 70 80 amps mm -hmm. on that startup current, right yeah that inrush current right versus a home that has a 200 amp service entrance wire coming into the home right that 200 amp can handle that more the 100 can't um which we see in homes quite often which can create that gotcha dimming. We're also going to see that manifest more on the older incandescent bulbs too. The LED bulbs, they don't take as much power. You're not going to see really that dimming like you would on the incandescent bulbs. I was just about to ask that. Mm -hmm. I was going to say with compact fluorescence and, and LED bulbs, uh, it, are we going to notice that as much? But you're saying no. Not as much. They, they, no. they take very, the voltage is very, I mean, it's still the same voltage, but the amperage is very low on those. Yeah, the amperage needed to run mm -hmm. those is, is a sixth of what, an incandescent mm -hmm. light bulb is gotcha um let's see so with with that stuff 
is when they're looking for a, an electrician to come out, um, how, how does someone, no, let's not go there. I'm actually going to talk more about the, um, about the system itself. You talked about aluminum wiring, uh, and a lot of people were, uh, se sorry, several people specifically said, how do I know when it's time to replace my electrical system? And periodically, I know most people have probably heard of a whole house rewire where you go out and you, you know, rewire the house, whether you're upgrading from old knob and tube wiring or, uh, you know, if you've got aluminum wire. Talk to me about the scenarios where someone uh, would need to explore that as an option. So a lot of times uh, when we're talking about a whole house rewire, um, Sometimes we're looking at just inadequate inadequate wiring. We'll go into some homes and you'll have two or three brand circuits trying to, to run that whole house. Uh, back when they built that house, maybe you had a lamp and uh, you didn't have much else. Nowadays, you've got so many more electronic devices. You've got vacuums, Appliances. you've got microwaves. It's stuff that we didn't have back then. So, so that's one thing. Aluminum wiring, we've talked about a little bit. From the year about 1965 to about 1972 is when they put most of that aluminum wiring in homes. And um, maybe you can talk a little about aluminum wiring, Troy. It's kind of... Well, aluminum wire, they actually, the Consumer Protection Agency, I'm not sure what that name of that is, I forget anymore, but they actually, in 1973, they deemed it dangerous for homes and they stopped using aluminum wire, right? Um, the well, metal... they stopped using it for branch circuits, Yes, right? for branch, branch circuits. circuits, that's correct, mm -hmm. yes. Um, that aluminum is a softer metal and as electricity runs through that the problem with aluminum wire is it gets a lot hotter right um, than copper does and so because of that heat it expands and contracts and creates these loose connections that we've been talking about and that can be very dangerous in a home so again if you've got aluminum wire i'd always get an electrician out there there's things that we can do you don't have to do a whole house rewire you can um, uh, but there's things on the devices that we can do to help, right, with those connection points so we don't see them loosen up and, and cause and create issues going forward. Also with the panel, right, we want to make sure the panel is functioning properly. And when you're putting uh, too big of a load on that branch circuit, that that breaker is tripping and stopping the flow of that current going to those devices. And that, that's something, sorry, were you going to say something? I was going to say one thing too, aluminum wiring isn't dangerous. It's the connection points on aluminum wiring. So just because you have aluminum wiring running all over, it's, there's no problem with it in your walls. But every time you connect onto a switch or an outlet or something, wherever that connection point yep. is, they can, like Troy said, contract and, and, uh, and loosen over, over time. So there's ways, there, there's different, like Troy said, devices. There's, there's different wire nut uh, Lumicons that we can put on there and you don't have to rewire the whole house. I've heard also with modern day outlets and things, the devices that go in the wall, that there's, there's an issue also connecting aluminum to a copper you know, connection because you know, the metals heat up at different rate or they expand and contract differently in that again it all comes to the connection points being an issue um but what, what are those alumicons that you're talking about that you can so so some homes we can go through and uh, wherever the connection point is we can actually get a small piece of copper wire and the copper wire is what we actually connect onto the outlet the, the device and then uh that connection point there then we get the copper and aluminum they're usually in different spots they don't touch each other we can put that on there so your connection point is no longer on your device and these uh these new connectors are are you all listed to, to not become not come loose and be safe that's a good point we talked about code ul is underwriters laboratory mm -hmm. that's where uh, they go through and they test the devices to make sure that they're safe for the application that they're being used for and so sometimes you can get knockoff products I, I see it a lot with uh, surge protectors or plug strips that you can get from uh, you know things that are that aren't UL that aren't that aren't UL listed that may not have that same um, quality you mm -hmm. know as far as that goes um, knob and see. tube is another one right that's okay. before aluminum wire so if you have that in your home um, be aware of that I'd always get somebody out there that a lot of times with the old knob and tube you'll see the fused panels right uh, and so just be aware of that I would definitely have an electrician out to check that and make sure everything's functioning properly if, if you run into situations like so that. So how would you know if you had knob and tube Troy what would you be looking for? 
Well, a single wire, pop your head up in the attic and um, we call it Romex now, right? And inside of that Romex, you have your hot wire, your neutral right wire and your ground wire. Knob and tube, you've got a single wire conductor that takes that electricity through the attic, through the walls, right? It's not protected by um, what we call Romex now. It doesn't have a, a sheath on the outside of it that has any protection there. It's a single wire. So, and, and that wire is, is ran through the walls, ran through the attic, the basements, all that kind of stuff. Go and ahead. when you say when you say look up in the attic, so that that knob and tube wiring there, if you have little porcelain mm -hmm. uh, insulators yeah. that go between that are that are in the wood where they would drill through, and yeah. then they would run that wire through, uh, and then that wire they would attach on, and they would drop that wire down the wall, yep. uh, and different things like that. So you might have a single run running down the attic, and then have wires coming off of it those little like porcelains yeah they're white yeah. too typically they're white and you'll yeah. see them and then they drop the the wire down into the wall or yeah. or to different and when you when you places. mentioned romex nowadays we use a better insulated wire and yep. the ground neutral and the hot wires are all run together but they're insulated and individually and, individual. and then yep. okay well, shane do you have any other clues that they might have knob and tube wiring i don't like mike said i get up there and uh, if you see any kind of the insulators up there you do have it uh, the danger in uh, knob and tube is that where they used to wire, they just had wires running through the house, and if they ever wanted to connect something else to it, is all they would do is scratch a little piece of the insulation off, and they would wrap the wire around that, and then they would tape it. So over time, that they're, where they wrap that wire, it becomes loose, and the vibrations, kids running around in homes, and uh, we've talked a lot about loose connections. Loose connections create heat. So... Um, there's even a lot of insurance companies out there that won't insure homes anymore if they have knob and tube in them. Mm. So, so yeah. we we talked a lot about uh, about all of those those things, the connections and the heat and all of that stuff. What about um, and we've been talking about older electrical systems and signs of that. What about people that still have the outlets that just have the two uh, slots in that, but don't have that third that make it look like a little face. Um, we, you and I know that that's the ground port, you know, that we know that, but like, is that an, is that a sign of knob and tube? Is that a sign of uh, aluminum? Like, what is that a sign of? It's just a sign of older wiring because back in the day, they didn't have to have the grounded conductor because the ground, I mean, to get technical, the grounded conductor, which is the ground, just it, uh, it basically, it speeds up the overcurrent device. It makes the breaker trip, right? Cause you know, so let's take for instance, a dryer if the dryer was not grounded, the metal on the outside could become energized. And if somebody touches it, it becomes shocked. Now, if that is connected to a ground, which goes back now, all of a sudden it shoots the amperage up, which is what makes that breaker say, Hey, there's way too much amperage and turns off. That's why there's a spark and boom, it kicks off. So when you think of like smaller things, when, when things get plugged in, a lot of them have grounds on them now is so that people don't get shocked when they're, you know, touching appliances or things of that nature. So, a lot of times people think that they can just go in and, oh, you know, it's got two, I'll just put the third. But now all of a sudden an appliance or something that's being plugged in that has that third pin that is needed in order to make it, you know, make it safer. And they go to plug it in on those. It has nowhere to go. So now it just energizes and it becomes a safety concern. That, I think, the last... Oh, man. That's supposed to be on quiet. <laughs> um, the, the last question that I want to, like, I think I want to wrap up with on today's episode is because I had someone actually ask this on uh, on TikTok is people that are buying a home. I want to talk about what they need to look for as far as their electrical system because some people will have a home inspector go out there but what are some things that they need to be aware of what are some questions that they need to ask because and what made me remember it and think of it brett was when you mentioned like um you just kind of glazed over it but a lot of people when they're remodeling a house and they're trying to update the look of it maybe they put a fresh coat of paint when they're getting ready to sell the house <laughs> fresh coat of paint and they change out the outlets because it had those two uh slots for the outlet and they put in a regular outlet that has the three holes uh but just putting an outlet with three holes in it doesn't actually put a grounding system there so when you plug into it if you think that you are protected you might not be and so let's talk about some of the things that um you know last thing what can people look for when they're going to get a new home what what are some questions they can ask or things they need to look at with that electrical system anything prior to 1969 um, 
they didn't require the three prong outlet in there that had the grounding right and so if the house is older than that and they have a three prong in there I would definitely check um, one thing that you can do go well, ahead you say check but I mean a lot of people probably aren't gonna be running around with a screwdriver and a and a, a flashlight and even really know what to look for so should they especially let's just do this let's especially if the outlets look you know fairly new and you see a three-prong outlet in a home that is uh, that was built before 1969 ask the question specifically is the home has the home got a grounding system Yes, you can. They may or may not know that, right? Sure, but I mean, you doing your due diligence and yes, asking absolutely. is what you should absolutely. do. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. What else? Um, one thing that can be done is you can go to a supplier, you can go to Home Depot or something like that, and, and they, they make a device that you can actually plug into those outlets. So oh, this that's would, a good point. This would be a good point for somebody that is looking for a home, right? Uh, you plug that device into the outlet, right? And it'll actually tell you if it's ungrounded or if it's grounded. To clarify, uh, and... What, for those watching the video, we'll put a, a, an image of this up, but it's, it's something that it looks like the end of an electrical plug, but it's got a, a device on the end. So you plug it in and then it's got three lights usually mm -hmm. that will light up and it has a different combination and there's a code or a, a legend or something that interprets on what those device. different light combinations mean. Yep. And that will tell you if it is grounded or it's reverse polarity or different mm -hmm. things like that. And there's a combination of those lights that say, Hey, this outlet is, is good to go. That device probably 15 to 20 bucks. Exactly. You can pick it up at the yep. hardware mm -hmm. store yep. and definitely worth going around. Now, a good home inspector should be checking for that yeah, type of thing. So important to get one of those. Yes. But I would definitely, you know, double check. What if, what if he, what if he was having an off day and missed that? And, and without that, uh, without a device, you can even look at a plug and you still don't know if it's right. You can't see electricity. So without a device, you don't know. Okay. Okay. So that device asking the question, what else can they, can they do? Any other recommendations when you're buying a new home to look at that electrical system? Ask, nope. ask for the report from the home inspector, mm -hmm. right? Get that report. Cause um, there's a good chance that the uh, home inspector actually caught that or didn't catch that and so it should be in that information so Our, what, one thing just kind of going back to what we started the show off with is and it's not required by code because you have like grandfathered in and stuff and that's the thing is required to do versus is better to have done it they're obviously going to be two different things but if you go out where the uh the meter is if there's just a small box with the bulb and there's no place to turn off then that means there's no outside disconnect which you know obviously that's something that you would want okay Anything else on that, you guys? I would just say uh, home inspectors, there's a lot of good home inspectors out there. There's a lot of newer home inspectors. Um, a home inspector doesn't mean that they're an electrician licensed or a licensed plumber. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna make the, uh, the jump and buy a home, you know how much homes cost and that cost nowadays. They're a lot, spend, spend a little bit of money and get a qualified electrician out there, a licensed one, who can really tell you what's going on. Yeah, and honestly, like if it were me and I were buying a new house today, I would have the thing checked out um, and then rather than demanding that they fix those things, if it's me personally, I'm going to try and negotiate down on the price because the, the quality of work that you are willing to put into a house that you're unloading, you're probably not as concerned. You're, you're going to try and get the cheapest thing done. Not, not that there's anything wrong with doing it inexpensively, but you're not, you're not going to be living there. It's not your family that's going to need to you know, be taken care of. And so you understanding how much those types of things cost and try and you know, negotiate the, the price based off of those things, not off of emotion. But mm -hmm. anyway, I don't know. Any, Troy, you got any thoughts? No. No. Nope. Um, any other closing thoughts on, on that before we wrap up and go? No? Yep. Well, uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed this episode. If you made it this far, thanks for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank my guests for joining me today, Brett, Shane, Troy. I uh, really appreciate you guys being our uh, panel of experts. We're, who knows what we're going to talk about next, <laughs> next electrical episode. But, uh, you know, that brings me to this point. If you have things that you want to, that you want us to discuss, uh, that you want some electricians to talk about and maybe answer some questions, even if you have a super specific question about something that's going on in your home, feel free to leave a comment below, uh, leave a review that has some questions, you know, whatever you need to do to try and get a hold of us. Uh, we'd love to, to bring as much value on these episodes. Uh, Austin, 
also known as AK, running the production behind the scenes. Anyway, thanks so much, everybody, for listening to In the House, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.